Hi guys, uh, it's Dr. Elawad from stepandrun.com and today we'll be continuing our section on immunology. Now to properly understand the immune system, we must have a look at all the components of the immune system, all the different types of cells, their function and their structure. But to properly understand all of this, we must, we must first have a look at where these cells come from in the first place, which is their site of production which is what hematopoiesis is. It's the production of our blood cells, our RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. So to understand it fully, we'll have a look at the areas of production of him, you know, where hematopoiesis goes on from the, type of, from the time of um, conception to later life. So we'll be having a quick look at the embryology and um, discussing stem cells and hematopoiesis in utero and then hematopoiesis after birth. So the most important factor when we talk about hematopoiesis is our hematopoietic stem cells. Now what are hematopoietic stem cells or HSCs? Well they are defined by their ability to replenish all blood cell types and their ability to self renew. What does this mean? So a small number of HSCs, hematopoietic stem cells, divide asymmetrically to produce a very large number of daughter hematopoietic stem cells that differentiate into all the various blood cell types, and a large number of HSCs that remain HSCs when they divide, even under the influence of stimulating factors so as to maintain their own population. Now, it is the same phenomenon that is used in bone marrow transplantation when a small number of HSCs reconstitute the hematopoietic system so that when a patient needs a bone marrow transplant, they're taken, cells, hematopoietic stem cells are taken from a healthy person and they're given to, this, uh, to our patient and those hematopoietic stem cells have an ability to reform fully the whole hematopoietic system. So this process indicates that subsequent to bone marrow transplantation, there must be symmetrical cell divisions into two daughter hematopoietic stem cells, some that are going on to differentiate and some that are maintaining the, the, the population. And this is what makes hematopoietic stem cells unique. And another thing, uh, multipotent, what, what does multipotent mean? Well, multipotent is just basically when you have um, a, a cell that's able to produce various types of other cells. So one cell can produce multiple different cells. So after conception and the embryo is developing within the uterus, when do hematopoietic stem cells first appear? They appear at about three weeks gestation. Where do they appear? They appear at the yolk sac, as well as the aortic mesoderm, the gonadal mesoderm, and the mesonephros, collectively known as the aortogonad mesonephros, also known as the AGM. And it is these areas that are primarily responsible for hematopoiesis all the way up until about 12 weeks or three months. At this point, or somewhere along the line, shortly after the HSCs are developing in the yolk sac and the AGM, they migrate to the liver. Now when they migrate to the liver, there's a massive expansion in numbers. Up until about the point of, um, up until about four months, when it's the liver that's the primary organ for hematopoiesis. Now there's also some hematopoiesis going on in the spleen but as you can see it's only about 20% at maximum whereas the liver is holding the majority of these hematopoietic stem cells is the, ma the major organ for hematopoiesis so it's interesting to note that the liver during development during embryological development is much larger much heavier and it's because of these it's because of its um, role in hematopoiesis now the liver continues to have a major role in hematopoiesis right up until before birth when it completely stops producing all hematopoietic cells. And somewhere along the line, 
at about four months, there's a massive migration of numbers of HSCs into the bone marrow. And slowly the bone marrow starts to take over the role in production of hematopoiesis. And by the time of birth, all hematopoiesis is going on in the bone marrow of all bones, bar a slight number that's going on in the lymph nodes. So once again, hematopoiesis in utero, in the yolk sac and the AGM, primarily at the beginning, the first three weeks, then migration to the liver, the spleen and the lymph nodes occurs after which the bone marrow starts to take over. From about four months onwards, the bone marrow is starting to produce hem hematopoietic cells. And up until the time of birth, it's the bone marrow that's the primary organ of hematopoiesis, with a small contribution from the lymph nodes. So, as we said at birth, all bone is all bone marrow is active, all bone has active bone marrow and all of it is um, having a role in hematopoiesis. Now there's two types of bone marrow, you have the active and the inactive bone marrow. The active bone marrow is also known as red bone marrow. The reason it's red is that it has a very high level of vascularity and it's highly populated by hematopoietic cells. And the inactive bone marrow is also known as the yellow bone marrow. And the reason that it's yellow is because of a high infiltration of fat cells. So at birth, or from the time of birth, all bone marrow is active. All of it is producing hematopoietic cells. This happens from the time of birth, the full term birth, all the way to the end of puberty. So all bone marrow in that time period is red and active. Now after puberty and continuing on to the rest of the adult life, only certain bone marrow or certain areas of bone marrow remain red and active and continually producing hematopoietic cells. Which areas are these? It's the axial skeleton, which remains primarily active in hematopoiesis, um, being the vertebra and the pelvis, sternum and the ribs, as well as the proximal end of the femur and the humerus. All of the remaining bones are yellow marrow. So, the interesting thing about the bone marrow is that it's very adaptive. So in cases of disease and severe hemolysis, when we're losing a lot of cells, a lot of cells are being um, destroyed in the system, then we're going to need more cells to be produced. So the bone marrow is able to become more active. How does it do this? Well, it does this through what we call red bone marrow expansion. What this means is that yellow mar bone marrow, the yellow marrow, which is inactive, has an ability to become active when it's needed. So the yellow marrow transforms into red marrow and you get a lot of hyperplasia going on, vascularity increase, increases, uh, becomes densely populated once again with cells and hematopoiesis is able to increase up to 10 times as much as when in a normal state. So in a clinical situation, how can we t tell if there's um, extra hematopoiesis going on in a patient. Well, you have your bloods and your x-ray signs. We'll talk about the x-ray signs later, but first your bloods. Well, you usually look at reticulocytes because reticulocytes are immature RBCs and the only difference is that they have uh, ribosomal DNA strands that become visible under certain strains. But these reticulocytes are a sign of production of RBCs and then in a normal state their number is about 1% of total RBCs. So how can we measure it in a quantitative form to tell if the bone marrow is intact and functioning properly? Well, you have the reticulocyte production index 
which is important when determining if the marrow is intact, if it's active and it's functioning correctly, i.e. is it producing enough cells to compensate for the anemia. And in such cases, when there is anemia and there's increased hematopoiesis, you'll find that the reticulocyte count is more than 1%. So, in a case of where you have anemia, say for example you have a decreased number of red blood cells in the peripheral blood, and then you find that the reticulocyte is still 1%. This means that the bone marrow is not adapting, it's not producing more cells than we need or are producing the appropriate amount of cells to uh, fill out the deficit. However, when you have anemia and you find the reticulocytes are a much higher percentage, whether it's up to 4 or 5% or however much, then that means the bone marrow is intact, it's active, it's functioning correctly, hematopoiesis is increasing and there's large numbers of red blood cells being produced to compensate for the anemia. And you also have x-ray signs as well as your blood um, to figure out if there is uh, bone marrow expansion going on, if there's extra hematopoiesis that's going on. Now, a very common radiological sign that you'll see a lot is commonly what's called the hair on end appearance. It's commonly described on skull radiographs, skull radiographs and it is the appearance of these long thin vertical striations that look like hair standing on end. Now why do you get this appearance? Well to understand why we'll have to look a little bit further at the actual structure of bone so we'll have a quick review of that. So what's the basic structure of bone? Well, you have two thin layers of compact bone, which are your outer table and your inner table. This is known as the vitreous table. And in between the vitreous table, you have the cancellous bone in between. And the cancellous bone is also known as your spongy bone. And it's located at the center of flat bones. Your scapula, your sternum, your ribs, and the center of irregular bones, the vertebra, and the epiphysis of long bones. Okay, and the intervening cancellous tissue is called the diploi. In certain areas, if you look like right here, it gets absorbed, and, these, and this leaves air sinuses in between the two tables. This has a number of different functions. Now, if you imagine if this bone was all solid, if it was all solid bone, so if you didn't have these, if you didn't have this air sinus, these air sinuses in between then what you'd have is a very heavy, dense, brittle bone structure. And it will also not allow for the attachment of muscles. And not only that, but there'd be no place for the bone marrow, because the bone marrow is located in this area here, in the cancellous bone. Now if this area was red or active marrow, it would have developing blood cells and lots of blood vessels, as well as a framework of reticular cells and fibers. However, if this area was filled with inactive or yellow bone marrow, it would be mainly fat cells that we'd be seeing in this area. So how does this all relay back to our clinical sign, which was our hair on end appearance that we saw on the skull x-ray? Well, overactivity of the bone marrow in response to anemia causes marrow hyperplasia, which widens the diploic space, as you can see here, widens the diploic space, and this thins the outer table. As it thins the outer table, you get destruction of the structure of the bone. And as you get this destruction of the structure, you find that some of these marrow, um, marrow cells extend through the bone and they appear on x-ray in the sense that they alternate with the opaque bone structure. And because they're radiolucent you see only the bone structure extending out which is the hair on end appearance that you see 
on the x-ray and this is commonly seen in um, thalassemia actually you come across it mostly but in terms of understanding hematopoiesis and how it ties into immunology we'll begin to discuss it further in detail in the next couple of videos we'll start talking about all the different um, immune organs or all the different lymphoid structures as well as breaking down how these cells specifically our T cells our B cells and macrophages and all the other cells of the immune system how they're um, differentiated from hematopoietic stem cells and we'll start to have a look at it a bit closer and try and break it down to make it as easy to understand as possible alright guys see you in the next video